So tonight I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we see going on uh, in the fire and emergency services in, times, in terms of uh, professional development and where you need to be thinking about or what you need to be thinking about in terms of your careers. Now, we have a generation, maybe even two generations coming up behind us or even with us tonight who want the GPS for life. Okay? They want to just type in a certain number of letters and numbers, hit go to, and it's going to lay out, I want to be a fire chief, this is what you do. Well, life is never that simple. Life is never that predictable. Uh, life is never that easy. Um, and just speaking personally, uh, I, my very first day at the National Fire Academy was a superintendent. I had never been here before. I had never, this had never been on my radar. This is not a job I aspired to do. My plan was that uh, I was a time, I was, I was a fire chief in Jersey City. I was teaching in the, in the graduate school, the doctoral program in education at New York University. I wasn't teaching fire, I was teaching education. So I just get out of my chief's uniform in the, in the office, get, walk across the street, get on the subway, two stops, I was in the NYU. And my plan was, I was going to become an itinerant professor in Europe, one appointment, one year appointment at a time. Okay, I was just going to travel around Europe and teach. Well, here I am 20 years later. So uh, if your life is so predictable that you know what's going to happen, uh, God bless you all. But it's my experience that it's very, very unpredictable. And the only thing I can guarantee you is that opportunities will come up. Opportunities will be afforded to you and if you're prepared, you will succeed. And if you're not prepared, you will regret that. And it will be one of those things in life that you will regret for the rest of your life. We've done a lot of research on uh, men and women in their 70s and 80s and even in their 90s and hundreds now. And that what they found is that people don't regret what they did. They principally regret what they could have done and didn't, or didn't take an opportunity that they thought that they should have. So uh, I'd like to prevent some of that from happening to you tonight. So uh, what I want to talk about is, are you ready for when these opportunities afford themselves and when they come up? And um, it's really, you can't see the forest sometimes for the trees. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. It's kind of confusing. There's a whole bunch of opportunities, and there's all different ways to go. And Do you want to be a fire chief in your own department? Do you want to be a chief at all? Do you want to go to another department? Do you want to go to do something completely different? This month, I've gotten four phone calls from very good friends of mine who are now flunking retirement. They don't know what to do with themselves, all right? Every one of you knows right now the day you are eligible to retire, right? Every one of you. And my question is, again, as part of this presentation, what are you doing to prepare for that? So let me start with a few open-ended questions. You're a parent, you're a mom, you're a dad, and your child says to you, mom, dad, or in your case, do you have any children? Yes, sir. Okay, how many? Uh, two. Two. How old is the oldest? Ten. Ten-year-old comes to you and says, Dad, I want to become a doctor. I really want to become a doctor. What do I have to do? To be Thank God. Okay, yeah. I don't have that much money. All right, sir. I'm going to tell the jokes, and you're going to laugh. So please, please don't. Let's not banter here. Help me out. Okay? <laughs> Dad, how do I go? What do I, if I want to become a doctor, what do I have to do? Go to, medical, go to college? Go to medical school? Residency, okay, you know the answer pretty much? Okay. Do you have any children, sir? How many? One. Dad, I want to become a teacher. What, do you know what the answer to that question, what I have to do? What's the, what's the answer? Go to school, go to college, get a four-year degree, okay? Uh, I want to be a nurse. Do you know the answer to that question? Yeah. Okay, study nursing, okay. Uh, I want to become an attorney. How about you, sir? I want to become an attorney here in the United States. What do I have to do? Yeah, help me out. Go to law school, take the bar, okay. Anybody in the room not in the fire service here? 
Let me ask you a question. Everybody's in the fire service? How do you become a fire chief? All right, let's keep it down. All right. Don't get nasty. No. There's no answer to that question. It depends upon where you are and what organization you're in and perhaps what state ordinance or state statutes or city ordinance requires, okay? You might have a civil service system. You might have a, uh, we used to say in New Jersey, you know, this is the way you got promoted in some departments. Um, sometimes it's an election. But we're not a profession. We're not a profession like law, nursing, teaching, medicine, the, the other uh, positions or the, the other uh, careers that we just spoke about. So um, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is uh, some of the ways that you become a professional. Now, um, these are all uh, people, I'm, and probably everybody knows this guy, Billy Goldfair. Uh, this is Derek Sawyer. He's the current commissioner in Philadelphia. He's kind of going the outgoing. Uh, this is uh, Chief Ben Barksdale down in Fairfax, I'm sorry, Prince George's County, uh, Virginia. This is Heather Burford. She's the chief down in Pinellas County, Florida. Uh, this is Rhoda May Kerr. Rhoda May is the, pres the chief of the Austin, Texas Fire Department. She is also the president, the current president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Anyone know who this guy is? Ron Sarnicky. He was the head of the uh, National Fallen Firefighter Foundation, right? Uh, this is Jim... Excuse me, Jim Clack, the only one of the few fire chiefs in America that's headed up two major city fire departments. He was the chief of Minneapolis, and he left Minneapolis, and he was the chief of Baltimore City, uh, Maryland, uh, for about five or six years. Uh, this is Chief Jeff Johnson from Oregon. Uh, Jeff is a f another former president of the IAFC, probably one of the most brilliant fire minds uh, in the country, really turned around to Tualatin Valley, Oregon. Uh, I used to kid that President Obama would go out to Tualatin Valley afraid that Jeff was going to take over the White House. Uh, and um, this is Chief Joel Baker down in Atlanta. And uh, he's been the chief down in Atlanta for a couple of years. But they are all uh, EFO graduates. And I could put up another 50, I could put up another 500 pictures of different people around the country who are EFO graduates who um, have, have gone through our program, but they all have something else in common. They all have bachelor's and master's degree, graduate degrees in different disciplines as well. And uh, they've all done exceedingly well. Uh, chief Kerr was also the chief in Little Rock, Arkansas, so she is another person who, like Jim Clack, was the chief of two major metro city fire departments in the country. So, you know, kind of what's going on, where are we going, what's, what's the secret to their success and your success, and it's really a path of professional development. I asked you about physicians, I asked you about nurses, I asked you about attorneys, they all follow the same path. There's an education piece, there's a training piece, all right? So, in other words, you, you can't sit in, does anyone know how long classroom work for medical school is? You go to medical school, classroom work, sir? Two years of classroom work. That's it. What do you do the rest of the time? You go around doing clinical, right? Doing what they call rounds, where a training physician teaches you how to handle certain different things. If you graduate law school, can you go to a court and, and appear in court? The answer is no, you can't. What you have to do is go to special training to be certified to appear before certain levels of the courts. If you're going to become a teacher, what's your, sec what's your third and fourth year of college? You go to practicums, right? Teaching. And all of the professions have the same components. There's an education component, there's a classroom piece, there's a training piece, and I'll explain that. There's a continuing education piece. Okay, and that continuing education piece is that to maintain your license, your whatever it is you have, you've got to continue to go to school, right? And then finally, there's experience, and, and I'll talk about experience in a minute and, and what all that means. So these are the four things that I talked about, education, training, experience, and continuing education. And I want to separate them out so that you can see what they are and what they mean. Education deals with the future. Education is about what you know. Education is about learning how to learn 
to acquire new knowledge or to discover new things. Okay? Training is about history. Training is about the perfection of technique. Training is about doing. So education is knowing, training is doing. Suppose, and I hope this doesn't happen to anybody, but suppose you have some serious medical malady, you go to a doctor and, and the doctor says you need surgery, <clears throat> but don't worry about it. I've read all of the books about surgery, but doctor, have you actually practiced any surgery? No, no, but I've read all the books. How's that sound? How about this? You go to another doctor and the doctor says, I don't bother with those books, but I've been cutting bodies for 30 years. I know how to do it. How's that sound? No, okay? So what you want is the right combination of training and education and experience uh, to do that. Uh, training, again, is about the perfection of technique. Experience is applying what you know to current or future problems. It's education and training, putting them together to deal with existing problems or new problems. And continuing education, the fourth piece, is about staying current in your profession staying current with what's new. So let me give you an example of that one. I'll use the medical model because it's neutral. Nobody can argue with me. Today, medicine is discovering that cancer is not site-specific. Did you ever wonder why, you, I'm sure all of, us, all of you have had this experience where someone in your family, somebody you love, somebody you know, uh, might have lung cancer. And they go to a doctor, the same doctor, they get treatment and they thrive and they're cured and nothing ever happens. And somebody else you know gets lung cancer and they go to the same doctor and get the same treatment in their last two months and they're gone. And medicine could never figure that out. Well, now they're beginning to figure that out. And what they're learning is that cancer is not site specific. They're learning that cancer is genetic specific. So you might have cancer gene one, two, three, four, five, but it could be in your brain. And somebody else could have one, two, three, four, five, and it could be in their liver. And somebody else could have one, two, three, four, five, and it could be in their colon. Okay? And if they treat one, two, three, four, five, you'll be cured. Does anyone know what they're using? This is kind of interesting. Does anyone know what they're doing is they're using a dead virus to introduce new genetic material to the site-specific cancer? Does anyone know what virus they're using? AIDS. The AIDS virus. A dead AIDS virus. Uh, it's kind of strange. But anyway, so, so now we're learning that, that, that cancer is that way. Now, do you think that there are physicians out there today that said, that's a bunch of crap. I've been, if you got lung cancer, you're getting surgery, radiation, and chemo. I know what I've been doing. I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't need none of that other stuff. Do you think there's physicians out there doing that? Yeah, there are. You just hope you don't get one. Okay, so when there's new knowledge, there are still the old school people that said, I've been doing it this way for 30 years. I don't care if they're physicians, I don't care if they're teachers, I don't care if they're lawyers. It's all the same. They're not staying current with what's new and what works. Okay? so. Those are the four elements. Now, to be successful in the fire service, in nursing, in, in physician, engineering, whatever it is, you need all four of those elements. You're not going to succeed without those four elements. And it really depends upon two things. One, when the opportunity arrives, are you going to have enough of that? Whatever it is. However much it is. If it's a pound, if it's a quart, whatever it is, do you have enough of that to take the opportunity? And that's what the employers are looking for. That's what the hirers of fire and emergency services personnel, doctors, nurses, everybody else, that's what they're looking for. Do you have the right combination of education, training, experience, and continuing education to do well? Now, if you have a lot, you're going to do better than the other person you're competing against. If you've got two and they've got four, guess who's getting the job? 
If you've got one and they've got six, it's not even a race. Now, I was just a part, one small part, of hiring for the superintendent of the National Fire Academy. And I was surprised at the quality of the men and women who applied for that job. But I was also surprised at what they emphasized. And this was the kind of stuff we were looking for. And some people, even though they had it, didn't emphasize it. Uh, some people who didn't have all of it <laughs> maybe overemphasized it. You know how, how job applications go. But the reality of it is, is that if you've got a lot of those four things, you are going to do better in the job market than somebody who has less than that. All right? Now, probably six months don't pass before I run across this person. So let me describe them for you. They're 26 years old. They've never been away from mommy or daddy. They've never made their bed. They hardly ever cooked a meal for themselves. And they come up to me at a conference, they go, you know, I'm going to rescue one here in Speed Bump. And I worked with this guy, Mikey, for like 13 years. You mean to tell me somebody's going to come in here with some piece of paper and be my chief and Mikey ain't going to get the job? Yes, and you're living proof why. <laughs> All right? You know them, too. So um, what they're talking about is somebody with, um, you know, they're complaining that somebody with a lot of education and very little continuing education, very little training and experience is going to come in and do the job. People don't hire those people. You don't get hired for the head of a department in a city government because you got a degree. You're going to have those four combinations of, of degree or of, uh, of things I'm talking about. This is, uh, this is Mikey, okay? And uh, Mikey's got um, very little or no education. He's got some training uh, and maybe some continuing education, some questionable stuff, okay? But uh, this is Mikey. This is who he thinks should be the next chief. And I have a life size picture of this guy going before the city council asking for a budget increase or more firefighters, or, okay, you, you can do the math on this. <laughs> you, know, you know where this is all going, right? All right. So what's the, uh, the lining, uh, the demarcation? What's the difference? How do we know what, what does what? How do you pick out what's education, what's training, or what's experience? Training and education are typically delivered by accredited institutions. The curriculum is standard. It doesn't matter who the instructor is, they're teaching standard curriculum with objectives. And they test to those objectives. There's an assurance of competency to the public. Okay? Uh, these schools test and they keep records. Got it? You can think about places like your college, your local community college, uh, your four-year college, your graduate schools, your National Fire Academy, your state fire training academies, perhaps even your local fire academy may be accredited through the state. Experience and continuing education are a little more ephemeral. They're just a little bit more vague, all right? They're kind of hard to define. They're not definable. They're good, they're useful, and they're necessary. You've got to have it. You can't walk out of school and expect that you're going to take these top jobs. But uh, this seminar is an example of continuing education. All right, you're learning a little bit about the job market, about professional development. Any of, this, any of the people that we talk, you saw Billy Goldfeder up there. Billy's all over the country. John Salk is a friend of mine from New York City. John's all over the place uh, talking. Uh, John Norman's another friend of mine from New York City. He's all over the place. Bruno teach. Is Bruno still teaching? Alan Bruno is still teaching? Oh, okay. So those are the people that are out uh, doing continuing uh, education kinds of things. And what's the difference? There's no standard curriculum. There's no records. Um, and you, what you always have to think about is you sitting on the witness stand in a courtroom. So I'm going to tell you this story, not for drama, but to tell you what the experience is like. 
March 19th, March 20th, 1993, we had a blizzard in Jersey City. I was a deputy chief, citywide deputy chief, get a fire. I was riding in a particular neighborhood in the city with narrow streets because I was trying to figure out which streets we could navigate and which we couldn't. An alarm for fire came in. Uh, it was about four blocks away, five blocks away. I respond to the fire. The first engine arrives, the sec first ladder arrives. It's a blizzard and it's at the change of shift. I don't know who's coming into work. I don't know who's late for work. I don't know who's standing by. Cause got, I got mixed crews. A woman comes running out of the house in a nightgown. She's holding a baby. She's screaming in Spanish. And my pigeon Spanish and her pigeon English, I understand. Her husband's trapped on a second floor with a mattress. <clears throat> you all know the story. If, if you've done it once, you've done it 20, you've done it 100 times. Kids playing with matches, sets the mattress on fire. The old man tries to put the mattress out, bundles it up, takes it out into the hallway, down the stairs, and gets trapped in the stairway with the mattress as it flares up. <clears throat> so the first engine off, I tell the lieutenant, Look, so we got a guy trapped in there. I said, you know, get a line in. We'll get some other people backing you up. First arriving ladder company shows up. Uh, I tell them to go up and, and vent. They know already. I don't have to tell them. We got a guy trapped, vent the roof. They're doing everything they need to be doing. But it's, the fire's going south on us. And it starts to look like it's going to backdraft. It's attached on both sides. The smoke is puffing out. And there's second ladder comes up. Two firefighters get off the ladder company. Somebody didn't make it into work. And there's an off-duty firefighter there with his son in a bodega getting coffee. He just happened to be in the neighborhood. And um, I just told him, I should get a 35, break those windows, the front of those windows in that, that. It was a two over a liquor store, so it was the second floor. So they were, it was snowing. It's all over the ground. I, so I told the off-duty firefighter to help them with the 35. He goes over, the three of them get the 35, they drop it into the first window, smoke comes pouring out, they pull a ladder back, lose their footing in the snow, and hit a 13,000 volt power line. Kill two of them. Now, the two of them are stand, I'm st right in front of me. Two of them are twitching and gurgling in the street, their faces are turning purple. The kid's watching his father die. I got a company trapped inside the building. They don't know they're trapped. There's no backup, okay? Long story made short, one of the firefighters was successfully resuscitated in the emergency room. The off-duty firefighter never made it. His name is Carlos Negron, he's on, on, he's on the wall. So um, that wasn't the hard part. Believe me, that wasn't the hard part. The hard part wasn't facing his family. The hard part wasn't going to the funeral. The hard part was the months of depositions and accusations from attorneys about where did you see this and what made this tactic right and all this other stuff. Didn't you know about those 13,000 volt power lines in front of that store? Okay? All accusations. I had the picture in the IFSTA book about venting with a ladder. Didn't matter. They settled, but, and, and, and the family was well taken care of. But they couldn't beat me on a witness stand. Not because I was a deputy chief, not because I fought fires, because I had an education and experience that, that withstood any testimony. So, you know, if, if you go, if you ever, I hope you never are, but. In our litigious society today, you never know when you're going to be on a witness stand. If you think that, you know, I went to, you know, 20 seminars and I did this and I, you know, I got a book full of certificates of attendance from, it's not going to cut it. It's not. Okay? Good stuff. You learn a lot. But as far as um, professional development, this is only one small part. So... Some education and training can substitute for experience and continuing education. So many job opportunities, people say, well, you know, we will substitute uh, five years of experience for a college degree, you know, something like that, or two years of college for EFO, whatever, whatever it is, but they'll substitute 
experience for education. And, you know, that, that's the way. But no amount of experience or education will ever substitute for education and certified training. Okay? So I don't care how much experience you have. I don't care about Mikey. I don't care about, you know, all this stuff. That is not going to hold water. So if you're looking for positions, if you're looking for opportunity, if you're looking for a job, you know, just keep this graphic in mind. You need all four. The, the bigger, the better. Okay, but that's pretty much how it breaks out. So, uh, what is a profession? Uh, it's a unique set of uh, knowledge and skills to a profession. It's like medicine, law, nursing, teaching, all of the things that we talked about. And it is not specific to geography or an organization. And we're still in the middle of that in the fire and emergency services. You can go to medical school in Illinois and practice medicine in Texas. You can go to law school in Maine and practice law in Washington, D.C., and Lud knows we need more lawyers in Washington. <laughs> you can become a teacher in Washington State and teach in Arizona, but if you're a firefighter and you learn to raise a 35-foot ladder in Speed Bump, Arizona, and you move to West Speed Bump, you have to relearn how to raise a 35 because we're different here in West Speed Bump, right? So we're in the process of getting all of that changed, but it's, it's a slow process. But the knowledge and the skills that you acquire as a professional transcend an organization or a geography. Um, there's always a testing and assurance of competency to the public so that when you are, whatever it is you are, whatever you have a license to do, uh, people know that you're qualified. Uh, there's a code of ethics associated with that. There's a professional standards that you have to meet. And this is an argument that I get into O'Neill, you don't understand. We're career firefighters. We have a union. We're civil service. We don't have to meet any professional standards. I got a hot flash for you. What's the biggest union in the United States? Teachers. Who hires teachers? Cities. They have civil service protection unless what? They lose their ticket to practice. And I don't care how good a teacher they are. What happens if you lose your ticket to practice? You're out the door, right? OK, so it doesn't matter uh, if you have civil service protection. It doesn't matter if you are in a union. You can still lose your job. And other people in the volunteer service say to me, O'Neill, you're out to lunch with volunteers. We don't have to meet professional standards. I got a hot flash for you. Doctors volunteer, nurses volunteer, Lawyers volunteer, teachers volunteer. If a surgeon volunteers his or her time and goes to South America to do cleft palate repairs on kids with birth defects, are they relieved of any professional standards because they're doing it for free? No. Absolutely not. Can they say, ah, oh, that's all right, we'll just do a quickie job here, we're just volunteers? No can't, all right? You want to get out of jail free? Get a free lawyer. Get a pro bono lawyer. A lawyer donated his time. You turn around and you say to the judge, he didn't or she didn't represent me. And sometimes you can get off. Even if you're doing it for free, even if you're volunteering, you're still held to professional standards. Um, they typically have professional associations. One of the things that we look at is it's a, usually a client-centered business or a client-centered profession. Uh, they have peer-reviewed research journals, and they are using scientific, evidence-based practice, which we're now beginning to see in the fire and emergency services. Evidence-based practice, big words, important words. Uh, our mission here at the Fire Academy is to hit three of the four elements of professional development. We have training in the fire and emergency services at the local, state, and national level. At the state level is typically where you get certified. And the National Fire Academy works with all three levels of that training to help you do that. We have the education piece. We've locked in the standard degrees for an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, and we're working on the graduate degree programs so that everybody has the same education. If you're a physician, anatomy and physiology doesn't change because you learned in Maine as opposed to Texas. Anatomy and physiology 
is the same. Teaching is the same. Principles of education. Nursing is the same. Engineering is the same. So fire degree programs were all over the place. And the men and women of the fire academy got all of that lined up in a voluntary way. There's over 90 now, 90 standard degree programs uh, around the country. Uh, and continuing education. Uh, that's a lot of what we do here at the National Fire Academy. Um, different levels of it, but uh, nonetheless. But that's all around the place. Uh, this is kind of what the system looks like, um, how it all fits together when we're a profession. And I'll talk about when you'll know that that happens. Um, but what do we have? Well, we already have a body of knowledge. We have systems to acquire the knowledge, training and education. We have the FESHI schools. We have the state accredited training academies. All right. Um, we have an outside system, outside systems to evaluate us, IFSAC and Pro Board. They're the third party that comes in and evaluates. The third party that comes in and evaluates the National Fire Academy is the American Council on Education. They tell us that they recommend college credit that the associate degree, bachelor's degree, and master's degree, depending upon the course that you're taking here at the Fire Academy. And you can transfer that credit into a college at home. Many of you have. Um, we have a refereed research journal. It's the International Journal of Fire Service Leadership and Management. I'll show you the picture in a minute. Um, we do have a code of ethics, and I'll show you that. And we are developing evidence-based practice. I'll show you some of that as well. Many of you are familiar with the term transitional attack. That's evidence-based practice. That was a lot of work. You, you can believe it or not. As they say, you know, the, the neat thing about science is you can have an opinion about it, but you can't argue the facts. Okay? And science is all of the things that you know what science is. I don't need to go into that. So these are some of the reports on fire ground field experiments, wind-driven fire dynamics, high-rise experiments, uh, evaluations. This is evidence-based practice uh, in our field. This is the International Journal of Fire Service Leadership and Management. It's published by Fire Protection Publications. If you don't have it, I recommend that you get a subscription. I, it's not much, maybe 50 bucks a year or something like that, but some, some good stuff going on. They do a research symposium each year down at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I go every year. Um, and if you don't want to pay for the subscription, you can encourage your library or your department uh, to subscribe, and they can do that. Um, and what are the um, continuing education things that we're looking at? Well, executive fire officer, managing fire officer, are continuing education kinds of pieces, continuing. Um, and then you have some designations through the, uh, the uh, Center for Public Safety Excellence, Chief Fire Officer, Chief EMS Officer. But all of these, the, these uh, Center for Public Safety Excellence, CPSE folks, they are self-certifications, okay? Self-certifications, which means you filled out the book on yourself. Now, you have to meet certain standards, and I'm not poo-pooing any of that, but it's not an outside evaluation. It's not a testing process. It's an evaluation process, all right? Uh, we, in, this, in these courses, we test you constantly in all the courses that you take. But um, they are what we call specialization. And every profession goes through this. Anyone here ever hear of a normal school? Raise your hand. I guess I'm showing my age. Yes, sir, what is a normal school? Do you recall? It was a school for teachers, but Help me out. Do you recall, sir? You had your hand up. You're going to say, OK. It was a two-year school. It wasn't a four-year university. It was a two-year program to prepare men and women to become teachers. That was a normal school. Well, now what do you need to be a teacher? Four-year degree, right? When you graduated from a normal school, a two-year program, you could teach anything. You could teach geography, math, science, history, social studies, whatever, science. Today, can you do that? No, you specialize. You're a reading teacher. You're a history teacher. You're a social studies teacher, right? Most people don't realize this, but medicine in the United States wasn't organized in the United States until 1916. Before that, 
most of the doctors carrying the black bag with the buckboard wagon were apprentices. Okay, they walked around, worked with another doctor. Now the surgeons went to medical school, the high-end doctors went to medical school, but the doctors with the, brown, the black bag that made house calls, they were apprentices, all right? And it wasn't until 1916 that they changed that. Does anyone know where your great-grandparents went for dental care in your community? Barbershop. Yeah, I'm glad they changed that, okay? That red and white pole outside the barbershop indicated sanitary, and you went to the barbershop to get dental care. Everyone knows Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer. Nobody knows Abraham Lincoln didn't go to law school because there weren't any law schools. He apprenticed. He read the law. And up until the 1930s and 1940s, you didn't have to graduate from law school to be a lawyer. You could read the law. So all of these professions went through this process. And once they did, once they became a profession, they started to professionalize. They started to spread out. Reading teachers, you know, the general doctors, you know, they, they treated everything. And now the doctors, they have surgeons for right hands and left hands, okay? Um, attorneys, you know, you, you did everything from wills to the Supreme Court. Well, now, if you're an attorney, you have ad, all, you know, family law, admiralty law, tort law, all different things. So every profession goes through this uh, specialization process. So where are we now in this process? Well, we're in the process of trying to keep all the plates spinning, to keep them moving, uh, to make uh, more plates. Education, training, uh, experience, recertification processes, and continuing education. What we're trying to do now, and what we're talking to people to do now, um, believe it or not, I'm not certified in anything. I, <laughs> I, I was never like firefighter one. I didn't have to. I was in Jersey City. We did our own thing. We went to our own academy. Were we accredited? No, we're Jersey City. You know who we are? Okay. Well, now, of course, that's changed. But, um, you know, now that, now that the people are certified and things like that. So um, now what we're looking at is if you're certified when you're 25, should you still carry the same certification when you're 40 or 50? You know, if you took a hazmat tech course in 1975, should you still be the chief in charge of hazmat? Uh, I don't think so. So we're looking to start discussing this recertification process. Where are we with that? So uh, these are the things in the profession that we still have to get sorted out. What do the credentials mean? What is the value to the employer? And we spend a lot of time with the city managers from time to time talking about the value of EFO, and we'll be talking about MO uh, in, the, you know, in the promotion process. Uh, what's the difference between a self-certification, a testing certification, and attendance certifications? You know, these are all continuing education. You know, what, what does all that mean? And it, we'll get them squared away. And it's going to be a struggle. We're going to have the doctors who say, I've been doing lung surgery for 30 years. You're getting surgery, radiation, and chemo. We have those people in the fire service. I know you probably never met them. That was the part where you were supposed to laugh. I control all your marks. Don't ever forget that. OK. So um, you know, we're still trying to work uh, this kind of stuff out. And, and, you know, and a lot of times, we're going to make progress one retirement at a time. Right? Don't you be one of those. So. What about the people that choose not to participate? What are the people that say, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years? What about the Mikeys who, you know, all dirty and snotty, and what happens to those people? Well, um, it happened in every other profession. Uh, the most recent one was nursing. There used to be, those of you who may, may remember this, if you wanted to be a nurse, you went to a three-year diploma school nursing. It was associated with a hospital. It was a three-year form of indentured servitude, okay? You went to school and you worked in the hospital. They don't do that anymore. It's all degree programs now, all right? And um, so law, it happened. Medicine, it happened. All these it, dentistry, everything that I mentioned. Uh, in those professions, history shows that as the concept took place, one or two things happened. Either the practitioners got into the fold 
or they just got out of the business, or they retired and nobody went to them anymore. You know, somebody figured out, I don't think I need to be going to the barber anymore to get my teeth fixed, all right? Let's go to this person who went to dental school. You know, they just go to different places. Now, in the fire service, you say, well, you know, we're the only game in town. Well, don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. Um, and there's no need to threaten or cajole. There's, this is going to happen. It's the inevitability. This is going to happen to our profession. And the reason that I'm telling you this tonight is because if you want to succeed in this profession, if this is what you think you want to do for the rest of your life, if you think you're the person that wants to be a leader in this profession, this is where it's going. This is where it's going. So anybody here been on one of those 787, not 787, the, uh, the uh, Airbus, the uh, three, Airbus 380? It's like a golf course with wings, okay? Double-decker plane. You know, you're going to either be at the airport and you're going to watch people get on the plane and go off into the future. Uh, you can get on the plane and take a ride into the future. Or you can stand on the runway and try to stop it. That 380 is taken off, folks, and you, you need to be on it. So, um, you know, this is the thing I get. This is, you remember, Mr. Uh, Rogers, right? You all remember. So nice, okay. You're special. Um, people, yeah, they all, everybody thinks they're special, right? Uh, you know, we're volunteers. We're Jersey City. We're New York City. Whatever, whatever it is, you know. Folks, this is all nonsense. This is where it's going, okay? If you want to be a success in this profession, this is where it's going. This is what they're looking at. These are the elements that they want in their professions leading the organization. So um, what are the keys to success? How much energy? You know, you can sit around the house and argue about Mikey all you want, but here's what the, kind of the plan is. This is where it's going. Uh, they're going to be following minimum standards. They're going to grandfather the incumbent. Your firefighter won? No problem. Your firefighter won. In five years, you're going to have to retest. Well, in five years, you're probably going to leave the service, or you know, you'll just do it to get it over with. Oh, you're going to give me the gold star up here? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And then it'll be you got to recertify in four years, and you got to recertify in three years, and now you got to take this many courses. This is where it's all going to go. Um, reasonable and increasing or decreasing recertification time, and you know the organizations will be the NFPA standards, the IFSACs, the pro boards that will be setting these standards, will be, we'll be making these things happen. Now, again, you can sit back and say, I don't care, or they can't do that to me. I got a hot flash for you, folks. If you don't think you want them to do that, you need to get involved. You need to get on a committee with the NFPA. You need to send in your comments. You need to be a part of the IFSAC or Pro Board process. True story. You never know, under the category you never know. I get promoted from firefighter to lieutenant, all right? My replacement on five truck in Jersey City was a guy named Bobby Cobb, Butchie Cobb. Anybody ever hear that name? All right, so Bobby and I go up through the job together like all of you and your friends did. I'm down here, uh, President Bush leaves office, now I'm the acting fire administrator. Charleston happens, nine firefighters killed. Across the back of the car, ISO rated number one fire department. On their patches, ISO rated number one fire department. On their fire trucks, ISO rated number one fire department. So I call, his nickname is Butchie. I call him, he's Butchie, come on down. Bring, you know, bring your bosses down. I said, Butchie, we can't have this. He said, what? I said, ISO rated number one. I said, you can't have standards, ISO standards, and NFPA, I mean, how many times did we have to find and paint the Cooper hose jacket to meet the ISO grading schedule, All right? And in that conversation, Bobby and his boss turned around and they changed the grading schedule. Now they follow NFPA standards for apparatus and equipment. They follow NFPA standards for training and certification. Okay, all that is part of that process. That wasn't any big thing. There's people sitting in this room five and 10 years from now that you know, and you're gonna make those kinds of changes in the fire service. 
Now, is that the U.S. Fire Administrator talking to the Insurance Services Office? No. It was Butchie talking to Dennis. But when you hang out with this crowd, the men and women in this room, Butchies get to know Dennis's, and Dennis's get to know Butchies. So that's the other piece of this professional development, this education and training piece. You're going to meet, you're, not, you're going to hang out with the, the stars. You're going to meet the stars. So uh, it's going to be contemporary. It's not going to be revolutionary. It's going to evolve over time. Uh, it's going to be achievable. And we're going to eat this elephant one bite at a time. This is the way it, it's going. So how do we know? When are we going to know that we are a profession? We are a profession, OK? I'm going to be looking at the wrong side of a lawn in some veteran cemetery. Let me assure you that it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. But um, all right, how do we know? How do we know when the light switch goes from off to on? What will happen? This is when you will know. When the profession can pull your ticket to practice independent of your employer. When your profession can pull your ticket to practice independent of your employer. I don't care if you're civil service. I don't care if you're union. I don't care if you're career. I don't care if you're volunteer. The profession will control the practice. So all right, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Um, you are the next generation of leaders for the fire and emergency services. One of you in this room may be the next superintendent of the National Fire Academy or a training specialist in the National Fire Academy, or the state fire marshal or the state fire training director. You might be the next US fire administrator or the next deputy US fire administrator. I don't know. But if somebody asked me when I was at your level in your career, if I was going to be here, the answer would be, are you out of your mind? No way. And that's how it's going to happen to you if you got those four boxes filled. OK? All right. Any question? That's it? OK. Was the pub opening late or closing early or something? All right. Folks, thanks for your generous gift of time and attention. Uh, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's just great talking to you about this stuff. If you have any questions, drop me an email, send me a note. Uh, stop me in the hallway, okay? Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.